Hello, boils and ghouls. Your old pal the Crypt Keeper here. I was just playing my favourite new role, slaying game. I just love to roll the bones and see what my character gets up to. Which reminds me of tonight's gruesome tale. Two podcasters that want to test their system mastery and are just dying to entertain you. So settle in, my fellow game monsters, and grab a bottle of mountain goo from the fridge. I call this nasty little nugget the world of tales from the crypt. <laughs> I just used mouthwash and then drank lemon soda. Yeah, that's disgusting, man. Uh, Don't do that. Oh, God, this is worse Uh, than usual. Yeah, no, that's like when you get orange juice and pizza together. Oh, yeah, those don't belong together, do they? No, Uh, man, that just tastes like vomit. There's only really one drink that's... Well, okay, one non-alcoholic beverage that's appropriate for pizza. Uh, And that's soda. Well, not just any soda. I think we can agree that the proper soda... No, no, the proper soda for a pizza is a root beer. No. No, you're wrong. The proper soda for a pizza is Coke. I just saw you drink root beer with pizza two days ago. Yeah, well, you make do with what you have. They had Coke on their menu, you... (laughs) (laughs) Lying bag of sacks. You're just disagreeing for the sake of disagreement. Ooh, son of a bitch. (laughs) I know what you're doing here. Listeners, what's the proper soda for pizza? (laughs) Don't don't answer later. Answer now. Call in. (laughs) Call in right now. We'll get to you. (laughs) We're taking calls. Answering the uh, big question of what's the best soda for pizza. <laughs> All right, let's go to the phones. Let's cut to a clip. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's cut to a clip. <laughs> uh, All right, we're going to go ahead and cut to a clip. I'm a cucumber. 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 Please don't take me to the pig. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Tell your do your little story. All right, that was great. That was Thanks. a great clip. Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> worth it. Yeah, it was a good idea. Good idea. It also settled the big question during the clip. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, of, I'm pretty uh, sure that did it. The proper pizza soda. <laughs> so, welcome to System Mastery, the podcast where every other week we get together, beat a dead horse or something. I don't remember, and uh, discuss an old role playing game. I'm Jeff, and as always, John is here with me. Hi, John. Whoop. And <laughs> whoop. Whoop. <laughs> Whoop whoop! Not the sound of the police. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I was waiting for. That first whoop was confusing me. I was like, "Where's the rest of it?" Hold on, wait a minute. I thought it was whoop whoop. That's the sound of the beast. That's that the really, next line. Is that really? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I never really understood the next line. Oh, well, I was now you know. Whoop whoop! That's the sound of the police. Whoop whoop! That's the sound that I need. Was what I heard, and I was like, "Well, this guy needs the police. <laughs> <laughs> he's having a he's having a tough situation right now. Uh, he just needs those police to show up, and he's he's singing to himself to to lessen the tension." Yeah, no, he's out doing police calls. <laughs> whoop whoop! <laughs> there they are. There's the police. I finally managed to attract them with my whoop whoops. <laughs> Ooh, it's a red and blue lighted police car. Ah, yes, native to this land. Ooh, it's so reticulated. Yes, you are. You're a reticulated police car. Oh, oh no, he's violent. (laughs) Quick, play dead. (laughs) It's not working. We're really really towing the line of offensive police violence comedy here. I feel like combining rapping and bird watching and police work are probably okay. That's fine. Yeah, all right. Everyone's fine with that. So, John, what did we talk about this week, or what will we talk about this week? So, uh, as you could probably tell from our intro, we are uh, doing Tales from the Crypt, although it's part of the Master Book system, and Master Book is, in the same vein as, like, GURPS or any of the other generic systems, it was supposed to be a... Here's a generic system to use for any setting. And then they came out with books for things. But they apparently got to the game late because they scraped the bottom of the barrel for all of their source books. So they have things like Tank Girl and Species. (laughs) I'm going to be honest here. World of Tank Girl sounds awesome to me. I wish we had it. I'm a big fan. Not just of the soundtrack, but also... Of the fact that it's got iced tea in it. I'm a big fan of tanks and girls. Uh, well, that, that is true. And I also like the villain with his water-stealing 
like slinky machine. <laughs> so I'm I'm okay with Tank Girl, but yeah, World of Species it's definitely a, a weird one to find. But this I feel like has got to be the bottom of that barrel, right? I mean, Tales from the Crypt is not. Hey man, it had a long running show on HBO. It had its own cartoon series. It was comic books. Tales from the Crypt is a household name. 60 Keep Minutes has been on the air for 40 years. I don't want to make a role-playing game about it. Oh, okay, shit. Okay, you know what? Yeah, Hold I on. do now. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> I'm a level 5 morally safer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's Andy Rooney. Roll for initiative. <laughs> you know what I hate? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, I'm on board for that. Never yeah. mind. Okay, so Tales from the Crypt. That's this ga- this uh that's what we're talking about today. And uh let's talk a little bit about this master book system because we actually this is what we do for you listeners. Because Tales from the Crypt doesn't have any rules in it, we had to read another book too. Yeah, we read two books for you, so we had to read Master Book, then read Tales from the Crypt. Right. Or you could read Tales from the Crypt first and then go back go through and read Master Book and be like, "Oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, okay. Oh, I get it. <laughs> that's what that is. That's what a role-playing game is. This book didn't explain them right away. Oh, I get it now. I have to use my imagination. It's a game of let's pretend, but with friends. That's what it was. I thought for some reason it was actually statting out the characters from the, the show, like the back of trading cards. <laughs> Which I would totally do. <laughs> Stat out the Crypt Keeper. The Crypt Keeper has energy protection powers of three. <laughs> Remember yeah. those from, like, the old backs of Marvel cards and stuff? Like, oh, yeah. the, And it was, like, I think it, when it was a scale from one to seven most of the time. Yeah, and so you like, had to get, like, if you didn't have any energy prote- projection, they still had to give you a one in it anyway. Oh, yeah, like the Punisher has an energy projection of one. Yeah. Like, I guess he could just throw a really shitty fireball. That's... <laughs> Yeah, he's the Dan of uh, the Marvel Universe. He's like, ah, I got a little fireball. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so angry about my kid. Yeah, <laughs> fireball. <laughs> Why aren't you using your guns? Because fireball. <laughs> <laughs> my Punisher is three feet tall and voiced by John Lovitz. <laughs> oh, excellent. That's what I want to see. Come on, Marvel, get on it. Get, let's get a John Lovitz Punisher. I think the world is ready. <laughs> That's what we've been waiting for. <laughs> I killed him with my bazooka. Yeah, that's the ticket. <laughs> All right, sorry. What the hell are we talking about? So Master Book. Master Book has uh, your base system in it. So you're going to start out, and uh, when you're making a guy in there, it's a point-by system for your stats. You have eight stats, and you have 68 points to spend. And your stats are... The eight of them are basically two stats per one thing. Yeah, so it's like strength and also strongness. Yeah, well, it's strength and endurance for yeah. your physical, and then agility and dexterity. Okay, well that I see that one a lot. That usually represents the difference between bouncing around and hand-eye coordination. Yeah, and in this, it basically just means nothing. It doesn't matter. I know. Uh, there's, there's mind and intellect. Okay, So right. just intellect or your entire brain... <laughs> It's just done by weight. <laughs> yeah, how heavy is your brain? It's like you start at 8 pounds and then you add point one pound per point. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have charisma and confidence. Okay, that, that one I can see. Confidence is a good equivalent to your basic what actual charisma is. I assume that in this game charisma is, is, has been redefined as hotness. No, well, it's mostly like charisma is how much people might like you based on what you're saying and confidence is how good you are at being able to say that to someone, I guess. Like, confident... Like, you can be a confident asshole that no one likes. All right, which one lets you know, me... you can en- be Trump. Which one lets me engage with, like, eights? <laughs> like, if I wanted to hit, it, to hit it up with a two set, am I going to need charisma or confidence? I mean, I've already got my peacock game ready. Like, I'm wearing some crazy blinged-out flame here. See, now, this is the difference between confidence and charisma. That's having high confidence and no charisma. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, buddy, but you just went down from a six to a four. <laughs> that just... <laughs> that happened. That just happened. Uh, so each of those are going to give you some derived stats. Uh, strength and endurance gives you your toughness. It's weird how you get it, too, because it's not it's not very intuitive. Each one of them, it, you take that number and then you look it up on a table. Yeah, there's a chart, and each time you get a derived stat, certain stats are more important. So, like, for toughness, endurance gives you more points towards 
your toughness than strength does. Correct, yeah. And then it's the same thing for the one that you get off of your intellect combined combined, which is your skill yeah. points. Yeah, so when you combine mind and int, you get how many skill points you get to start with. Right. And uh, your intellect is more important for that. And toughness is basically hit points, right? Uh, no, toughness is your armor, essentially. Oh, that's your right. natural uh, armor. Yeah, because Because game... everyone has the same sort of hit points. Called life points. Yeah, so, well, no, your life points are different. Oh, sorry, you've I got, thought life you, points were hit points. Yeah. You've got three different things that sound like they should be hit points. So you've got toughness. So you've got toughness, which isn't hit points, it's how tough you are, so mm -hmm. it's damage reduction. You've got life points, which isn't actually hit points, it's, it's like points you spend in order to do things. So, like, you can get a re-roll off of spending Right, so they're basically the fate points, or the, the ma whatever magic effect, brownie yeah. point type thing, yeah. So you get five of those, mm -hmm. uh, and then there are your... Uh, there's your shock resistance, right? Which is just your endurance, and it's how many points of shock you can take. Okay. Uh, and then there are wounds, and wounds are what actually hurt you, but everyone can take six. Wounds are usually what hurts me, but words get me too, buddy. Yeah. Well, you know, I've got all of these sticks and stones here, so. <laughs> Damn it, my bones! <laughs> I needed those. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's you've got a bunch of random crap. Oh, your move. All of your different moves are related to uh, agility and or dex and then strength. So, and then like your jump favors strength more for how far you can move whereas your basic dash is more dependent on your dexterity. It's just weird. Yeah, it's a, it's not very intuitive. You, you, it feels like you'd spend a lot of time looking at the book to play this game. Oh, well, you'd have to just have your chart handy and look at it all the time. Yeah, and there are quite a few charts in here. Yeah. Now, skill points are really weird in this game because the skill system it has a lot of different ways that you can buy in and get some skills. And then they have this whole thing called a macro skill, which is not what it sounds like. Yeah, so you've got your... Your skill points, just anytime you put a point into something, you get one. A starting character can't have more than three in any given skill. You have specialties, which you can't have more than two in any given specialty to start. But the specialties just are the same as a generic skill, but it uh, only applies to your one specialty within that skill. And the weird thing to me is they call them ads. And they let you buy them even if you don't have the base skill. Yeah. Uh, but you can only have up to plus two of whatever your rank in the skill is as a specialty. So you can have two dots of a specialty in something you have no skill points in. So for example, if, say for example, you had the persuade skill, but you didn't want to be able to persuade at all, you just wanted some secondary effect of persuade. You just you want like. to be really good at haggling. Yeah, like you're specifically very good at haggling instead of persuading. All you can do is haggle. You can't persuade at all. So you take a specialty for of two dots in the persuade skill. And then macro skills are, uh, it's worthless. Because basically, like, driving is a macro skill, and then it, it boils down into things like vehicles, or, uh, you know, car, cars, car, and planes, boats, and boats. And... Except that having the macro skill doesn't get, you, you think, oh, macro skill driving, I'll put a point in that, and then I'll get one point in all these other skills, and then I can go down and, and add points to the, the individual skills in the macro skill. But it doesn't work that way at all. Instead, macro skill is just a term they use to suggest that certain skills are related, but don't actually have any sort of mechanical connection. Yeah, it's just a way that they can get away with making it look like their skill list is smaller. Yeah, it try they tried to organize their skills that way, and it, it, it so it doesn't actually do anything. No, when you pick a macro skill, you just get one thing, and that's that's it. It doesn't let you get better at the macro skill. It's just I picked this macro skill, and all that meant was I get a lesser like tier of that uh, skill. Right. It was weird. It's just an organizational structure that I don't know why they felt like you need to write that down in your character sheet. Because if you look at the character sheet, it's got shit like, oh, what's your skill? I have a skill in macro driving cars. Like, why don't you just put down cars? Just, why are you writing all that down? Stop that down. Stop that. Yeah. So, okay, after skills. Well, the I was saying before, sorry, the, weird, the weird thing about skills is they call them ads. Yeah, they do. And that fucked me up throughout the whole thing. Because instead of talking about... Like, oh, we're going to add this onto there. They're like, you have a skill adds, and then it says something else. And it, I was reading it as, a skill adds something as a sentence, but it's no, skill adds are its own noun. There's a lot of weird terminology in this book that throws you for a loop the first time you read it. Like, for example, this game has cards in it. There's like a whole big thing with cards. Yeah, there's the master deck. Which we'll talk about, but one of the things with cards is you are either in or out of rounds. 
And that's, that determines whether or not you are currently in a time where you're allowed to throw cards on the table to a- activate a card trading a- engine. But it's not like, oh, the, it's currently card trading time or whatever. It's you're in rounds or you're out of rounds. Oh, boy. I, I don't know what that is. Anyway, we'll get to the cards later because yeah. they're kind of later in the book. But the next thing you really we really got to talk about is this book has merits and flaws. Yeah, and they're advantages and compensations. Yes, advantages and compensations instead of regular old merits and flaws. They're organized into columns, uh, columns which are de- degrees of severity. So a severe uh, good thing is an advantage that can be as high as like C4. or Yeah. yeah. So it, it goes or uh, a- column... A4. Yeah, column one, two, three, or four. Mm-hmm. And so if you get a uh, column one advantage, you have to take a corresponding uh, column's worth of... Uh, compensations. Correct. So if I get a column two advantage, I need a column two compensation. Now, can I take a column two advantage and two column one compensations? No. You have to take from the same column that you got it from. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. So uh, a column one advantage is usually just like a skill benefit. It's like, oh, you, you are slightly better at driving. You've got a little bit of money or... You have some notoriety, or you have a decent contact in places. A small amount, though. You have a small dick. And then a dog gets it. <laughs> yeah, a dog comes out and bites your dick. <laughs> well, if you say that, like you're excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about a dog biting your dick. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, you're excited about it in the wrong way. You're not like, yay, yeah. finally, a dog bit Jeff's dick. Yeah. It's, it's more like, yeah. You sound like a yeah. stripper or DJ. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, coming out on the stage, a dog biting a dick. Yeah, yeah. get your dollars ready, gentlemen. <laughs> Give it up for Bowser. He's gonna bite a dick. Coming up is Wowzers. He denies the Holocaust. <laughs> Didn't happen. <laughs> oh, tips, please. No one's throwing me money. <laughs> I'm a horrible dog. <laughs> God damn it. Okay. Oh. Uh, okay. So. Okay. So. Uh. Basically, advantages go as high as column four, and column four advantages are basically superpowers. And there is no column four disadvantage. Because that if you have superpowers, you don't necessarily need to have super weaknesses. The, the balance for that is that most campaigns don't even let you take column four advantages. Yeah, the one thing that Masterbook has is each of their settings tells you what you can do. So, for instance, uh, the Tales from the Crypt has three C1s, Two C twos and one C three. Right. So you have to, at most, you can get those ones you want. You can, uh, they say you can try to haggle down. If you want to get like a C two instead of a C three, you can trade your C three for a C two. Right. But man, I don't know why you'd want to do that. But yeah, you can. I, I guess just to avoid having a C three disadvantage or a, a yeah a C three, which is a compensation three or a big disadvantage. Uh. But you automatically get a a compensation dis or a, a C three disadvantage in this game if you're playing World of Tales from the Crypt because you have a feared enemy. Yeah, you have a C three enemy, which is the Crypt Keeper. Okay, so why don't we talk about that? Because honestly, this is a review of the Crypt Keeper book, so we we should really start talking about the Crypt Keeper. He's your enemy in this game. Yes, they split off from the TV show, which was mostly just the Crypt Keeper tells you a tale, and so you like. Read you something that happens. Yeah, it, it's like if they had written World of Elvira and Elvira was, tr- Elvira was trying to kill you. Like, Elvira doesn't try to kill you. She just sets up dumb stories and wags her boobs around. Yeah, just like me. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what it says on your business card. Yeah. <laughs> Professional boob waggler. Boob waggler and raconteur. <laughs> the, uh, the icon is just a top hat with a couple of waggling boobs under it. <laughs> yeah, but in this, they've decided that uh, in order to make it so that your characters have some sort of interaction with the fact that this is Tales from the Crypt, the Crypt Keeper is a malevolent god. Yeah, it, basically he's like the evil director. He's like Arcade from the X-Men. He, he is the one in, that is responsible for all the stories that he's telling. Mm-hmm. It's basically him setting them up. And so they say that he has a bunch of windows into other worlds. Yeah. And it, it kind of goes back and forth between he has windows into other worlds and likes watching other people get, like, fucked up and murdered. Mm-hmm. And then it says that he also will sometimes just pluck people out at random and put them into worlds in order to fuck with them. Right. 
I, it's a weird take on the Crypt Keeper, because, I mean, really, what did the Crypt Keeper actually do on his show? He told some puns, he giggled a little, and then you got to see some boobs, and then and then some gore, and then it cut back to him, and he was like, well, that was some boobs and gore. <laughs> Good night! Ah, uh, yes. Right? I mean, that's that's pretty much what he did. He was, like, doing that Tales of the ri- tales of ri- Rivalry thing, where he just pop in and go, well, I hope this week we actually see a butt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're saying... Tales from the Crypt was the Red Shoe Diaries of Horror. Yeah. Okay. Am I wrong? <laughs> it's, it's the Hitchhiker of Horror. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, with the Hitchhiker of Red Shoe Diaries, you've got this one guy who kind of wanders from small town to small town. Is like, I showed up in town and I heard that people were boning. And then they did. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you a story, brother. Let me tell you a story about these two that were just doing it, like going at it. Oh, man. They did it in like three different positions. I was at the window. So, I mean, I saw them go at it, and then they got at it in a different position, and then they went back to the first one. They didn't know I was there, though. I was in the bushes. Helpful, an unintrusive hitchhiker. That's me. That's me. I'm just jerking it in your bushes. That's me. <laughs> That'd be great if that was actually what the hitchhiker was called. <laughs> jerking it in the bushes. <laughs> and it's just a bunch of shots of people doing it from windows. <laughs> just... But- just like bored couples that have been <laughs> married for like 20 years trying to add spice to their marriage. Oh, I wish they'd take that blanket off. You don't need a blanket to do it. That's not how God would want it. Yeah. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, gee, they're doing it in the shower because that way they don't get their sheets all sweaty. Oh, they put the kids to bed. It's time for four minutes of sweaty, uninterested sex. <laughs> <laughs> for me, the hitchhiker, telling you this story. I was jerking it in your bushes. And now I'm picturing the Crypt Keeper version of our parody, which is just the Crypt Keeper telling you about people who die of heart disease. <laughs> <laughs> this nasty little tale is of a man who had diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> He's a real sugar pie of a story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the number one cause of death in the country is auto accidents. Let's see some of those. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> but no, I mean basically that's what the Crypt Keeper does. He just he just sets stories up. He's he's Elvira or uh, there's a few other guys who did that who were interesting horror openers. Yeah, and that was always just his conceit. It was it was like I've got a giant book yeah. of horror stories and I'm reading them to you. There we go. And in this, it's. I'm in charge of these stories, and again, there's a weird thing where I'm not sure if he's making them happen, or he knows they're going to happen, and so sends people there. Right. I, I'm picturing it as exactly like the show, except that once he opens the book, he's like that Duck and Muck cartoon. Remember that? The old Looney Tune? It's, it, Duck and Muck's the name, but it's the Looney Tune where Daffy is wandering around as an animator keeps changing things. It's Oh, it's that one where Daffy's wandering around and he's jerking off in your bushes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one where Daffy Duck jerks off in the bushes. <laughs> and then, oh. and then, so or a Tweety says, "I taught, I taught, putty tat." Oh no, wait, it was a duck dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord, god damn it! No, the, anyway, it's just that he has creative control over things that are happening, and he can just sort of pluck people around and put them where he wants. Yeah, so, so that's that's what's happening in this story. Yeah, it is the Mario Maker of horror, is what this is. <laughs> sure, <laughs> or the Sims of horror. Yeah. So, <laughs> and horror would be a great thing for Sims. Well, I mean, you can already do it. There's, like, ghosts, and you can add vampires and oh, shit. Oh, yeah, but... man. I had a long-running relationship with my dead wife. Yeah, no, and I one, t- one time I put Charles Xavier in a house that was haunted by eight dead juggernauts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Sims. <laughs> that was, like, the first Sims. <laughs> when when uh, modding it was still a huge thing. <laughs> uh. Okay, anyway. So, in this game, the big differences are you get those advantages. Uh, you get your uh, little column advantages and disadvantages. There are several new skills that you can choose from when building your character to play in the uh, Tales from the Crypt universe. Yeah, so there's already uh, a big old skill list from the Master Book system. And it doesn't cut any of them out. It just adds new ones. Yeah. And in addition to that, there are uh, the macro skills we talked about, and then there are ones that it splits up into things you can use untrained. And any skills you can use untrained, uh, normally how skills work are... Whatever your skill points are, you add it to the stat, and that's your entire skill. Yes. This is just, if you can use it untrained, you use it with just your baseline stat. Right. Uh, So, then there are ones that you cannot use untrained, and you have to have the skill in order to try and do them at all. I can already tell what you're setting up, because it's one of the dumbest things in the Tales from the Crypt book. Yeah, no, normally, things that you can't use untrained are stuff like, 
you can't fly a plane untrained. You're or, not a surgeon. Yeah, you can't perform surgery or, like, I don't know, shoot a rocket or whatever. Yeah, you can't use complicated machinery, that sort of thing. Anything that would require, like, college training, you can't use untrained. Sometimes you can't use, for example, archaeology untrained in games because, uh, yeah, you can dig stuff up, but you don't know what it is and you don't know how to do it right. Yeah, you don't have the actual training for it, so you can't use that skill. Yeah, but sure, this that game, makes sense. This game has not one but two untrained, new or un, no untrained allowed new skills, which are stupid as hell. Yeah, and the favorite one, by far... Yeah. Is improvised weapons. That's correct. You cannot use an improvised weapon untrained. You cannot do it. Yeah. Which means... And and here's what improvised weapons does. Because it's not hit people with improvised weapons. It's become aware of improvised weapons in your environment and pick them up. Yeah. That's what the skill is. If someone comes up to you and is like, Hey man, you need to attack that guy. And you're in a kitchen full of knives. You're like, well, I don't know what to do, man. Yeah, there's no swords in here. There's no knives in here that are weapon knives. I mean, I have literally, I mean, literally, if you have the improvised weapon skill, then you're like, oh, look, a table leg. I could use that as a club. Yeah. Oh, I'm, like, at a pool hall. I can use this pool stick as, like, a staff. Okay. Yeah, but if you don't have the improvised weapon skill, you're just like, oh, crap, I'm in this bar and I, I have nothing useful here. I'll have to put down my, my glass of drink and get off of my stool and put my pool cue away and go find a weapon. <laughs> Yeah, it's so weird. And it's it's like all it does is give you the cape. I mean, it, all it does is remove what was a standard ability in the in the core game. In the core game, because there was no improvised weapon skill, you could just pick up whatever and use it as a club. Oh yeah, they were just like, oh, what is this? Uh, you, you find a rock, you pick up a rock, it's some dude with a rock. Great, who gives no a no fuck? problem? It does improvised weapon damage. It's listed on table ten. Then in Tales from the Crypt, it's like, no, you can't do that anymore unless you take this skill. You don't know what an improvised weapon is. And then it includes example lists of things that are good improvised weapons, including kitchen knives and baseball bats. Yeah, which that's those are two weapons. Those are actual just weapons. A, a, a baseball bat is not an improvised club. It, it is, is a club. It is a club. That, yeah. that is what it, I mean. It's literally. It was originally called a baseball club. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cudgel. That's all it is. And a knife is a stabbing meat tool. Yeah. You. But if you get a knife from someone that's like, here's a stabbing knife. This knife is only for stabbing. You're like, oh, I can use that. Does that mean if you went through your kitchen and just labeled everything as actual weapon terms, like even if they were wrong, you're like, well, okay, I'm gonna grab this knife. But it's labeled flail. But that's cool. I can use flails. I, I took this butcher knife, labeled it short sword. We're Good going. It's fine. We got it. Okay. The other one is radio or simple radio operation, which is that your character can't even try to use a radio if, unless he has radio training. Oh, good. Like, and it, it doesn't specify what, I mean, it doesn't say, like, car radios or whatever, but I like to think that that's the thing. Like, you literally can't even use AM, FM. Yeah, but some, some guy gets into your car, has that skill, and he's like, Hey man, it's a little quiet in here. And turns it on, and you're just like, what the fuck is that? What did you? Are you a sorcerer? <laughs> you're a wizard. <laughs> but but really, it's probably supposed to be like shortwave and ham radios and stuff. Which again, maybe you can't use them very well untrained. But if you pick up a CB radio and hit some buttons on it, you might get some crackle. You might get something. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I can dick around with some knobs and hit some buttons and find somebody out there who wants to tell me about things. Yeah, I mean, granted, it's probably going to be like a Russian numbers station or something. Yeah. But, but you know, you're going to find something. You can find something. It's amusing to me, especially with the radio skill, because then it says people who are trained in this are especially useful for making radio calls out that won't get there in time and screaming desperately for help to uninterested listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well... It's trying to play up the fact that this is a horror game, but don't give me a skill that's like, you could use this to do nothing, pointlessly. Yeah, or you could not use it at all. <laughs> those Great. Are, those are your options. Thanks. It's, I mean, because, you know, the players are supposed to read that and go like, oh, radio skill, that seems like to be pretty useful. I could play like a park ranger or something. And then you read the rest of it, you're like, oh, all this will ever do is get nothing or static or someone, or maybe the ghost will come on the radio and be like, radios won't work. Eee! <laughs> 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 useful. Yeah, so good. I'll get on the radio and someone will be like, we'll send someone to help you right away, but it was really the killer and the killer shows up. <laughs> yeah. Great. So anyway, that's trying to get you the tone of what this game is. Because this is really, I mean, I feel like it maybe goes three pages at a time before it mentions, kill your players! It's so weird because it also understands that that's dumb. Yeah. And so it constantly has these little sidebars where it goes, hey, as the Crypt Keeper, you want to try and murder everyone and have them all get, like, gruesomely destroyed. 
As the game master, though, you want to make sure your players are having fun. And you're like, um, that's a conflict of interest right there. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I understand the concept of your characters can get killed because you're playing friggin' Tales from the Crypt, so people should get killed, right? So maybe people can get on board with that and be alright with it. All you do is you set up your standard meat grinder game scenario. Your character gets killed? Great, now you're playing as the town butcher or something. It's not that big of a deal. No. Well, the big thing is, this game also, for its setup for how your sessions work, wants you to do one of two things. Yeah, there's a couple different ways to play. So, your first one is you can play one-shots. You can just do the standard Tales from the Crypt thing where it's, alright, everyone plays a character in this story, we're gonna play out one session, it's this story, and then we're done. Right, and, and I mean, the problem with that, of course, is that it doesn't really describe how a Tales from the Crypt story actually goes. Because Tales from the Crypt story is never like, oh, four guys are wandering around in a mysterious dungeon. It's always, a new guy comes to town, and he falls in love with one guy's wife. And then that guy gets jealous and turns the new guy into a hamburger. Yeah, it's always stuff like, oh, there's a, a couple that shows up for a honeymoon retreat. But then the bellhop wants to murder them, and you're like, yeah. okay. There's there's never more than two main characters, and if there are two, they're fucking. That's that's the storyline. It's always it, the most couple main characters you get is a a uh, newlywed couple. Normally, yeah. it's one new guy. Yeah, occasionally you'll get things where it's like, oh, you have an entire cabin of people that are trapped in a storm or something, right? And you might go up to like, yeah, this time we had like six or seven people. Okay. That happens occasionally. One of them's always the bad guy, though. Yeah. Which, at that point, if you go, oh, you're in a cabin with six people and five of them are the PCs, you're like, oh, we we get we kill the last guy. Yeah. Because like, that last guy's obviously a murderer like of some day kind. day one. I, I, come on. Now we can play this through as if it, there's no bad guys in the cabin. We're going to play Langoliers instead. <laughs> the bad guys are dreams and weasels that come out of your butt, I think. Is that Langoliers? No, that's Dreamcatcher. That's Dreamcatcher. Sorry, yeah. Langoliers Lang is, <laughs> Langoliers Pac is the time... Sky Pac-Mans. Yeah, it's the time travel one. Yeah, okay. There we go. I've got my uh, Stephen King books confused. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Tommy Knockers, huh? Uh, is that boobs again? Is that an Elvira thing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good. Yeah. You did it. You 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 got it right. Yeah, that's what it is. She's got some sweet knockers, so... She's got some sweet Tommy knockers. She's, I don't know what Tommy means. I assume it's just a mispronunciation of Tony, which is a, you know, a, a word for ritzy or high class. What? Yeah, it is. It totally is. So it's t Tony knockers. Yeah, so Tony, Tony, Tony was just a band that was all about being high class. It's all about Tony Stark's boobs. That's what Tony... I've never read Tommy knockers. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't even think Stephen King knows. No. I think he's famously said that most of the books that he wrote during that period, he was high out of his mind and has no recollection Yeah, in of. fact, that's all I know about Tommy Knockers, is specifically that Stephen King doesn't remember writing it. Yeah. That's all I remember. What is it? What, what, what's Tommy Knockers? Uh, weird alien shit that starts morphing people. Okay, I know you're a big Stephen King guy. Yeah, well, I'm just big in horror in general. Right, so, you so, so you've read your Stephen King. I've, I've read Tales from a Buick 8. Which is a good one. It is pretty good, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I read that because you gave it to me, and... There you go, Steve <laughs> Stephen King, done. Woo! <laughs> That's uh, not true. I've read uh, Cujo, and I've read Misery. Good. Yeah. I never did read Cujo. It's all right. It's a short one, so it's easy to get through pretty quick. I've also never read any of his big, crazy epics that nerds are supposed to read, like Dark the Dark Tower stuff. Yeah, the Dark Tower series is great. I know. I'm sure it is, and I, I just love reading about all the various movie adaptations and then watching nerds scoff at how it's impossible. Well, because there's been a movie adaptation that people have been talking about for years right, that has yeah. never gotten off the ground. I, I believe when it started, people wanted Jeff Goldblum, and that gives you an idea of... I mean, because at this point, Jeff Goldblum is a uh, is a... Fairly hearty, but definitely old man. He is a old, distinguished gentleman. He plays he plays grand grandfather roles now. He's yeah, he's so moved he, on. He could be the main gunslinger in this because it's supposed to be an old, weathered, uh, like Clint Eastwood oh, type. It's supposed to be a Clint Eastwoody guy. Yeah. All right, sure. Could it, could Clint Eastwood play it? No, he's too old and crazy now. <laughs> Wouldn't that make it better? <laughs> Even better. <laughs> just It'd be amazing. Dark Tower starring Clint Eastwood just yelling at nothing in the distance. Ah, hey, uh, hey, you. Hey. I've got fucked Obamacare. <laughs> Get off my lawn, Obama. <laughs> that's that's uh, not the line, Clint. Don't you tell me how to do the line. <sighs> it sickens me. <laughs> uh, okay. What the hell are we talking about? <laughs> fucking, okay. Tales from the Crypt. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, this. So this has... Uh, in the book itself, there's also a few things that it gives you that change the game a little. 
Uh, yeah, there's the, the big secret one. So in addition to the, the skills, it changes up the deck. So the yeah. deck that you normally use is a bunch of things that will either add, like, some uh, bonuses to certain things. Like, maybe you get a bonus to physical skills or mental skills, or you get a bonus from someone who comes and helps you or whatever. Yeah, the deck is weird. It's like... Well, there's, you, there's first... a split between... Things that give you just straight up bonuses and then subplots. Yeah, there's action cards and there's subplot cards, and they tell you to print them and then give them borders based on what they are. So a subplot card is a red card, but um, and they include things like you know you know more about the bad guy all of a sudden, or heroic switch, or uh, backstab, where you where your player decides to turn against the rest of the party, and so you can you get all these cards, and it's so the, the mechanics of them are so weird because when you first think, oh, this game's got a deck of cards with bonuses on them. You're like, okay, you probably get five of them at the start of the game, and then you can play them to, you know, oh, I have to use a, a rope climbing skill. I'll play the rope climbing card I have in my hand. What a coincidence! But you can't just do them whenever. There's, like, active times you're allowed to play the cards, and whenever that happens, you're also allowed to enter into a trade period where you could trade cards with people. Yeah, and then if you ever draw a subplot, you have to either immediately get rid of it or play it in front of you. You get to put it in front of you, and then your your DM can be like, oh, that one will not apply in this game. You, you can't use that one. So instead, here is a life point, and you can draw another card. Yeah, so, and then there are ones like, if you draw Martyr, which is, you're going to die heroically, you as the player can go, no, I don't want to draw that. Right, you can just p- pass it. In that case, you don't get another card draw, but you still do get a life point. Yeah. So, I, I don't know, it's a really weird kind of arcane-looking system. I feel like we get people emailing us if we didn't mention it, because it's got to be one of the weirdest things about Masterbook. Yeah, the the deck system in there, I don't know what the fuck they're trying to do with it, but, okay, it's it's sort of like the uh, the brownie points or fate points from some other things where you're like, oh, I can spend points and make something happen. Like, I want a cool thing to happen to my character, so I do whatever. Except you can't control it. It's like... Oh, you drew the fucking uh, backstab thing, so now one of the characters you trust is backstabbing you. And you're no, like, you're backstabbing them, because one of them is, is literally that you turn on your play, your fellow players, and you get a plus six bonus to whatever it is you're doing, as long as it hurts your players. Yeah, so there's a bunch of weird stuff that will just show up, but since you can't control it, it's just, oh, you're all having fun, doing whatever, and then, you know, Tommy drew the card that fucks everything. I mean, I appreciate that it gives you a narrative control mechanic in this game. It's kind of an early game. It's an older game to have a mechanic that's like, oh, well, you can actually tell the DM a story feature. Because in the 80s in particular, that was like, that does not happen. Well, even then, it was still, you're not telling him something that happens. It's, I drew a card and he decides how that gets worked in there. Yeah, it's fits and starts. Yeah, so if it's like, oh, there's an accident that happens at some point in time soon... Someone is going to have an accident, and yeah, he one decides them, what it is. One of them is a general disaster card, and when if you draw it, then something bad happens. Maybe not to you, but definitely something bad happens. Yeah, there it's you go. Weird. It's I mean, especially because in that case, it's like you drew nothing. You drew a card that the DM needs to use that doesn't even need to affect you. Yeah, it's just giving him more to do. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Anyway, just thought we should get in there. Back to uh, back to Tales from the Crypt. Now, so they they change the deck up. They change the skills or add more skills. Really. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing they add, which is completely unique to Tales from the Crypt, is there are Crypt Keeper points. Yep, Crypt Keeper points. The Crypt Keeper points are, you don't want to have any, the fewer the better, because what Crypt Keeper points are, anytime you piss off the Crypt Keeper, you get Crypt Keeper points. And if you make the Crypt Keeper happy, you lose them. Mm -hmm. And if you have a certain number of them, it starts being more and more likely that your character will just be dead. Right, because your character can die, but then just show up at the beginning of the next story. Yeah, because the other conceit outside of one-shots is you quantum leap around. Yes. So Basically, you this just... game is like sliders or quantum leap, depending yeah. on which one you'd like it to be. Yeah, so the, he either bodily sends you to a place, or just has your spirit inhabit the body of someone else in his story. Mm-hmm. And you show up and do that. And if you die, what might happen if the Crypt Keeper likes you is the next adventure starts and either your spirit goes into a new guy or your body shows up, even if though you were killed, whatever. He's the Crypt Keeper, he can do whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. But if you have a lot of Crypt Keeper points, then he just goes, nah, fuck you, I don't like you, you stay dead. You've been no fun for me. I won't bring you back anymore. Meh. Yeah. I'm Skeletor now. <laughs> I don't like you, He-Man. Skeletor, we're cold. <laughs> I'm not nice. I don't care. <laughs> and 
he prays. Beast man, take a shower for God's sake. <laughs> uh, that has been our Skeletor. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't understand Facebook at all. Someone explain this to me. <laughs> Skeletor's my grandma? Yeah, Skeletor's your grandma. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great. Uh, your grandma's a skeleton, but she's like super swole, though. <laughs> my grandma, so swole. So swole, so skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and that, the Crypt Keeper points just adds more stuff in the game where it's like, oh, uh... We want you to be super adversarial, but the Crypt Keeper points are yours alone. You're the only one who sees them. DM. DM is the only one who sees yeah. Crypt Keeper points. So the DM is just like, all right, I, I know what everyone's Crypt Keeper points are, and I know how likely it is for someone to die. And the game's like, oh, we encourage you, because the more points you get, there's a percentage chance that something will happen. Mm -hmm. Like, we want you to, uh, when someone dies, roll some dice and then laugh maniacally and not tell them what's going to happen. I'm like, write down a note. Great. Yeah. Ugh. So annoying. But this time it's actually codified. Like, normally when it's like, oh, decide whether or not to kill your players off, but do it behind a screen and pretend to roll dice. But this time it's actually like, no, build points, and here's how you determine whether or not Crypt Keeper points will permanently kill someone. At the end of an adventure... Roll a d10. If you roll under their Crypt Keeper points, they die. If you roll over their Crypt Keeper points, they live. And then <laughs> it goes on to be like, yeah, but if you want to have someone just die permanently or live, do it. I'm like, then why the fuck did you put Crypt Keeper points in here? Because <laughs> it had to involve the Crypt Keeper. Oh, incidentally, I don't think we ever even discussed the core mechanic of this game, how to roll and do things. Yeah, so there's, uh, you have a dn, which is your difficulty, difficulty number. number. Yeah. And the way it works is you have your skill, so mm -hmm. either just your attribute, if you can use an untrained, or if you've got the skill, attribute plus skill points. Right, and then you roll 2d10. So you roll 2d10 and add those together. Mm -hmm. If you rolled any 10s and are trained in the skill, then you can re-roll any 10s and add those on to what you already rolled. And keep rolling until they're not 10s. It's yeah. exploding 10s. Uh, and whatever you get total, you then check against a chart mm -hmm. to see what your bonus number is. And it can go anywhere from, like, minus 7 to your roll to, like, Plus a shitload, because it just keeps going if you keep exploding your tens. Right. Uh, then you add or subtract any modifiers for, uh, like, if it's rainy or low visibility or right. they're falling down or whatever. You do all of that. You take that. You take your whole number. You check it against the DN. And then you go, okay, so my total with the adjustment from this, plus my skill, plus my stat, plus whatever, was, like, 12... And it was a regular DN, which is an 8. So I got a plus 4 over that. And a plus 4 means I got a good success. Right, and this this game has one of my least favorite things in game in older games, usually in percentile games, which is the big chart of synonyms. Oh, yeah, because it's... Oh, what's the difficulty of this? Oh, what what's the difference between easy, regular... Uh, not difficult. Usually it's when it... Yeah, not difficult. Usually it's when it gets into the hard, because it'll say things like, very hard, difficult, ex exceedingly complicated. Oh, yeah. The, troublesome. One of these is, uh, complicated, hard, difficult. Who... Does anyone want to guess what order that's in? Because I didn't do it in the order it's in in the book. <laughs> Yeah, these are synonyms. Don't do that. Especially, it's even worse when it's success ratio charts, when it's like, you succeeded exceedingly well. You succeeded exceptionally well. You succeeded great. Yeah. Like, oh, good, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, you know, how well did you manage to screw in that bolt, Jim? Exceedingly well. Oh, that's too bad. Huh. I was kind of hoping you'd get an exceptionally well, because now the bolt's going to fall out. <laughs> uh, and that chart is also a chart you check for damage. So if I hit someone, depending on how high my damage number goes above the DN that is their armor, armor. and yeah. whatever, I check it against a chart, and the chart gives you me, like, four different things. There's always a number, and the number is how many shock points they take. Right. The There's either a K, an O, a K slash O, or a KO. And if you get a K, you get a K. If you get an O, you get an O. If you get a K slash O and you don't have a K, you get a K. And if you have a K, you get an O. If you get a KO, then you're knocked out. <laughs> if you get a K and an O together ever at the same time, then you get knocked out. Yeah, and if it's a TKO, then the game ends and the ref determines who won based on the number of connected punches. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's knock down, there's knock back, 
there's stymied, there's, uh, let's see, there's wounds, you can, if you go high enough, you start wounding them, which it's real hard to fucking wound someone. It is. It takes forever to hit wound on the chart. Yeah, it really does. It takes a long time to actually do any damage in this game, but weapons do an insane amount of damage. Oh yeah, you have to be at, like, at least on the chart, like a plus... 10 over anything in order to start wounding them. Right. But even then, randomly things on the chart will be like, oh, if I was plus 7, they get a K. If I was plus 8, they get KO'd. I'm like, okay, but if I go to plus 9, it goes to O. So I, I'm really trying to hit that 8, because if I get a 7 or 9, I'm not knocking them out immediately. Like, it's weird. It's fucking weird. Uh, but it does give you the ability to do something interesting if you're not a combat character, which is, if you're one of the characters that's all about, uh, like, charisma and stuff like that, you can do roles to trick or taunt someone. Yeah. And those let you do things that will stymie. And stymie means you can't get re-rolls. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can set back someone, and anyone who is set back has a, uh, something bad happens to them. The book just says, something bad happens. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, you can make it so they're untrained, so they have to roll... The skill without any skill points, just the stat. Really good if they happen to be carrying an improvised weapon. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, what, why am wait, I wait, carrying wait, this? What is, this big heavy metal thing, what am I, what am I even gonna, I guess I'm gonna iron, cause this is an iron, so <laughs> <laughs> that's why, must be why I'm here. Or you can trick them and give yourself what is called an up, and an up gives you a free reroll. Oh good, an up. Right. Instead of just calling it a re-roll, they called it an up. Well, it's the same, the fucking skill adds still bothers me I every know. time I read it. Me too, also with in rounds. Uh, Get out of here with that. If you're in a round, you're in a combat round, not in a, di- a uh, card trading exchange. What is happening? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, okay. So, we got to talk about the actual setting stuff. Oh, me. yeah. Well, they, they give you a town. Yeah, they, they so set they up give a you whole the town, town. Of, of, like, Gainsford. Yeah, New Gainsford or something like that. And it has... It's in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And it has a bunch of shit that's like, oh, here's an auto garage, and the guy who runs it's crazy, and... Here's a comic book shop, and the guy who runs it is crazy, and here's a local famous horror author, and he's crazy. And right. And one literally thing I, everyone is, he has a dark secret, and is yeah. crazy. One thing I really wanted to talk about with the town is the women. Because <laughs> there's, there's one woman in town who gets stats, and she's a succubus. She li- she's like the one who owns the the uh, the, bot, the the flower shop, and her whole deal is that she sucks people's life force out and uses it to keep herself alive and to keep the flowers growing. And that's, you know, that's a fine Tales from the Crypt story. There's a witch who's been living in town since 1909, and she pretends to be different women and, yeah. and, and so on. That's fine. She's the only woman who gets stats. Every other character in town is married or has a girlfriend, but their girlfriends and wives don't get names or stats and are instead just described as lookers with roving eyes. Yeah, I, I think... I think there might be one. I think one of the librarians is a lady. May, oh, library. you know what? There's another sexy lady. There's a there's a woman because it's very briefly mentioned at the end. There's another woman whose husband is in a coma from a car accident, and her whole deal is that she wants to bring men home and sleep with them in the bed that her husband is in. Huh. because that's what her husband would want. And she's described as like the hottest person in town. And actually, both her and the flower lady are described as the hottest person in town. Great, because that's the only description that they had for women in this book. Well, yeah, because it's Tales from the Crypt, and women are only hair to be boobs. Oh, yeah, they're straight-up boobs. In fact, even the art in this book reflects that. When they have, like, the uh, the customized character sheets, because they're like, oh, if you want to have a quick character you can make, here's a town investigator. Here's a town weirdo. One of them is an escaped mental patient, and the, and it's just, the whole thing is a normal escaped mental patient, like his... His quirks are that he's insane, or their quirks are that they are insane, and their their strengths is that they're unusually strong. It's perfectly fine. And then it cuts to the art, and the art is a woman seductively stripping out of a straitjacket. Great. Somehow her straitjacket is opening in the front so she can have her her chest exposed. Yeah. Like what is that? You can tell it's a straitjacket because it's got the straps and stuff, but straitjackets don't open from the front. That's the whole point of straitjackets. Well, that's how she escaped. <laughs> they put it on wrong. <laughs> There's some there's some insane asylum guard who was like, I'll put this on in the front so I can see her boobs. Oh, boobs. <laughs> so boobs. annoying. So the, the book is deeply sexist. The number of times the phrase, phrases like roving eye or uh, unfaithful uh, woman, uh, naughty woman, what done him wrong show up is incredible. Oh, yeah. There's, there's some guy who can speak to the dead if he has taken their picture both when they were alive and dead. Mm-hmm. And he's the town photographer, but he's become super withdrawn because he's just talking to dead people. And he's in a relationship with the old prom queen. 
that is dead now, and he's trying to find her body to bring her back to the life and then fucking fuck a corpse or some shit. Yeah, everyone in town has these dumb little secrets. Like, the richest guy in town has his insane murderer brother living in his attic, but he can't tell anyone because he's being blackmailed by the person who helped his insane brother escape the insane asylum, who's the guy who owns the co- the comic book shop. Uh, it, it just goes on like that. So basically, you're supposed to go into town and realize that everyone in town is a murderer. Yeah. It's weird that literally everyone in town is like, no, they'll murder you. Yeah. There's a police force, and they're all super corrupt. Can I tell you, I've only actually seen one episode of Tales from the Crypt. Really? Yeah. So I have, I've seen enough to know what the show is, huh. but I've only seen one episode, so that's all I, that's how I filter my, my opinion of Tales from the Crypt through. Which is weird, because the only, like, I've seen plenty, and I can't remember most. Yeah. There's one I remember that is nothing like the normal ones, and I thought was great, which is someone gets, like, pulled over in a little, like, bumpkin town, mm-hmm. and they're in court, and there's the court-appointed defense attorney, but she is an attorney, and so it's this bumbling guy that keeps trying to help her, and every time she's like, no, fuck you, I'll represent my own case, she fucks it up, because she doesn't know that the town in this, like, the law in this town is all fucked up. Right. And every judge she goes to looks the same as the old judge, because they're triplets, <laughs> and they, they're meaner as they go, and every time, the main guy's like, I'd like to appeal for community service. And they're like, no, get out of here. <laughs> and so at the end, he's like, the meanest one who's like, I'm going to murder you. You're going to get the electric chair. He's like, appeal for community service. The guy's like, yeah, sure, you can do that. And then they take her to the electric chair. And she's like, I thought I was getting community service. And the guy's like, no, this is for me. You have to do community service now. And then she's the public defender and has to stay there forever. <laughs> God. Okay, the one episode I ever saw was a lumberjack. And the lumberjack lives in a, he lives in a mountain town, and he's a new lumberjack in town, and he's different from every other lumberjack because he won't use chainsaws. All right. He only uses axes, and he's really good with axes. He's the best with axes. Even though it's clear that he's very slow, even with an axe, because huh. chainsaws are just faster than axes. Anyway, he falls in love with the foreman's wife. <laughs> And 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 uh, she's an, she's got a wandering, roving eye, and she's you know, yeah, she's got a lazy eye. <laughs> <laughs> she's a wandering eye, and so she she seduces him and brings him into her her uh, house. Where this is the only thing I really remember about this. She drops her towel out of the shower so you can see her boobs briefly, and then they're hooking up. And the foreman comes home, and the woman immediately. It turns out that the woman uh, does this all the time. Brings home a man, and then the husband kill kills the man. It's like a thing they do. Okay. So, but instead of killing him, they just hit him in the eyes with his axe. So he goes blind. But this time, because he lives, he manages to stumble out of the house, and people realize what's happening. And so the final, the big denouement scene is that they're finally teaching him to use a chainsaw instead of an axe because he's blind now, and he's cutting down two hollow trees in which are the gagged foreman and his wife. Oh. So that's that's the last one I remember, or the only one I've ever seen. Oh, there you go. And it, it's, it's standard structure for one of those. I yeah. So it's a revenge tale. It's got boobs in it briefly. Yeah, no, and I mean, the book does give you a, when writing a tale for this, try to include, like, romance and a sense of irony and some thrills and whatever. Don't worry too much about action. That's not what this is about. You're like, okay, that's, yeah. that's fine. It's it, it's kind of funny how that, that that's the case, but then, like, when you read the sample adventure in the back of the book, it's all like, all right, you guys are attacked by three clowns who can't feel pain. I love the circus adventure in the back, where Okay, it's, first of all, it's a shell adventure, so you have to play in shells. Well, you don't have to, but they say you should. Yeah. But, uh, you end up at some circus, and what the, like, fortune teller guy is stealing people's souls, and as he steals them, they get, like, superpowers. They get circus powers. Based on whatever they were. Right, so there's, like, a dog-faced girl who's a werewolf, and there's a whole bunch of skeleton clowns who can't feel pain. Yeah, because the, oh, the clowns have to laugh through the pain, so they can't feel pain anymore. Right, and there's a guy who breathes fire because he's a fire eater. Yeah, and, and but the, the ultimate, I mean, it's neat because there's a whole bunch of mystery, and you can meet a woman who's pretending to be a fortune teller and tries to tell you the secret of the circus. And at the end, you can kill the big circus ringmaster by by getting him to shatter himself in a hall of mirrors. Well, yeah, it's he opens the box to steal your soul, and if you go into the box, you can, if you make like a will roll against it, you can burst out of the box, and if you burst out of the box, it breaks, and he breaks. Yeah, it's kind of cool, but the problem is that the presentation is, okay, now you have to go into the funhouse to solve the next part of the puzzle. Inside the funhouse, a fire-breathing man and three clowns who want to fight you. 
Yeah, it's or like, it's, oh, I'm going to go check out what's happening with the snake charmer. You were attacked by four cobras. And you're like, ah, oh, God, okay. <laughs> All right, fine. There's four kobolds in here. I mean, cobras. There's cobras <laughs> in this room. It's a 10 by 10 foot tent. Yeah, and they have lasers. <laughs> they have red lasers. They have cobras with red lasers, and they, they all say, I was once a man. <laughs> Hateful partisan. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, that's I feel like that's basically everything about this book. I mean, oh, the shell thing is kind of weird because here's how shells work. Shells are when you get transplanted your character's personality instead of your whole character going to a new story, just his mind does. Yeah. So the you get a new body, then you keep all the physical stats of the body, and you keep your skills and then like your mental stats and your charisma. Yeah. So which is weird because if you know you're gonna be playing a shell heavy game. Oh, yeah, you 100% put all of your starting stats into your uh, yeah, mind and intellect and charisma and confidence. You go, oh, I dumped my physicals, because who gives a fuck? I'm going to jump into a guy anyway. Yeah, you said that's what we're doing. We're playing in Strongman. Why would you even make me design a whole character if we're never going to use him? Anyway, fuck you, I have straight 13s in my, int- in my intellect stats. Oh, yeah, we didn't mention stats are between 5 and 13. That's correct. Yeah, you have 68 points to spend on 8 stats. So an average character... Is an 8 or a 9. Yeah, we'll have an 8 or a 9 in all of his stats. Yeah. So there you go. All right. So, uh... You want to talk about favorite and least favorite? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it up. Let's Let's do do it it big. (laughs) All right. John, what would you say is your favorite thing about World of Tales from the Crypt? Oh, okay. Best thing in this is... I'm gonna go with the actual, uh setting thing i like the idea of uh like the shells that concept is great to me especially because you can also just send them bodily to somewhere so if they go oh i dumped my physicals entirely you're like great the next adventure you show up somewhere does this have anything to do with your quantum leap tramp stamp yes yeah i was <laughs> this has to do with the fact that i have a tattoo of al on my ass <laughs> And then the one cheek says, it's a stupid pile of gummy bears. <laughs> and meanwhile, he made me get a tattoo of Sam's little hand thing on his... Wait, do I have That's right? Al. That's Al. Sorry, you have Al on your ass. You keep fucking it up. I don't. I didn't really watch that show. I'm going to make you watch Quantum Leap. <laughs> I've watched the important episodes. The one where he's a monkey, and the one where he's a retarded guy. Yeah, good job. Okay, you great. Did it. I think I also watched... One, there's got to be more than one where he's a black guy living in, in pre-civil rights... Uh, there's a couple. I was gonna say, cause that, that's like the most important lesson there's, you can... There's one that is literally just driving Miss Daisy. Okay, great. He is, he is a black chauffeur for a well-to-do white woman that is old. Okay, but you, you're a huge Quantum Leap fan, so for you, this game is almost Quantum Leap. It's just like Quantum Leap with a bunch of extra boobs well, and it, axes. It's horror, which I love anyway, and then it adds in the concept of, like, leaping between different dimensions and having a bunch of different stuff happen. I love that as a concept. Yeah, it's stuff that you wouldn't expect from a Tales from the Crypt game, though, but it's interesting. Yeah, no, the fact that they added that in as an option in addition to one-shots, I was like, oh, that's cool. That's an interesting way to make a campaign without it being like, yeah, this same guy keeps showing up in towns where people are getting murdered. It's real weird. (laughs) And then he jerks off in the bushes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I saw this old lady going at it with this other guy, and then hit him with an axe. Oh man! Imagine how great it would be is if the host, if they had a host switch on those shows. If the, if the Hello, like, boils and goose. I watched two people having sex from their yard. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah, the uh, so that I think is interesting. That's my favorite thing in the book. What is your favorite thing? Uh, I'm gonna say the tone. I really like the the fact that they, you know, the crypt keepers in this book a lot. Oh my, he, he's in here a little too much. Almost a little too much. But like, for me, Every was, time I'm reading through a section and it gives me another dumb pun, I'm like, I get it. I fucking get it. Stop. But, but don't be late. I hate it when people are late. And then I make them late. <laughs> just like every third page. Yeah, yeah. Or every third paragraph, even. Oh, yeah. He just constantly shows up. Of, oh, did I have a pun to say? Let me work that in there. Okay, back to the book. <laughs> Water under the bridge, my friend. Six feet under the bridge. Just just goes on like that. Ugh. Anyway, so I like the tone. I like... This book was going to be a hard sell for me, because the Crypt Keeper basically has one running character, and he's not involved in the stories. So unless this game was playing as Crypt Keepers, 
Which would have been really neat. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> let's competing crypt. Keepers. No, just, just imagine a whole party of crypt keepers walking around in like a crypt. They're like, we have to keep this crypt. Thing is, and orcs are attacking. In the in the old uh, comics, there were other people. There was a crypt keeper, and then there was the like vault master and a gate something or another. But there were three. There were two guys, the crypt keeper, and something else, and then one of them was a girl. And it was the three that told horror tales. And okay. it was rad. How much better would it be if this was that game? Where you played as those sorts. You have to make a ghoul and like wander around and make tell tor- terrible puns. Oh, yeah. No, it's <laughs> it's just are you afraid of the dark in a Tales from the Crypt setting? Because all you do in a game is go, All right, I'm going to tell you a new tale. <laughs> How about this? How about if Crypt Keeper was just an add-on to uh, D&D and it was like the bard? <laughs> You just play as a Crypt Keeper, and you have the ability to, like, stymie your enemies by just telling them a boring story about boobs. <laughs> One time, boobs! And then someone was murdered over the boobs! <laughs> and your enemies... Well, you've gotten real lazy recently, Crypt Keeper. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> oh, season seven. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> this burned out for me after season four. I'm just phoning it in! <laughs> I'm just... Boning it in at this point. Ah, oh, and so was the hero of tonight's tale. He was boning someone with with his 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 penis. I, I, I why am a, I here? I was in the yard jerking off. <laughs> Again, I really want the hitchhiker to be the host of of tell, What am I doing in here, folks? Let me tell you, I'm trapped in a crypt, and I'd really like to get out. Anyway, there's a book here about how like some guy got murdered by some small town bumpkin. I I kind of wish one of them had sex. I mean. I don't know if that's just me, but for me... Any, anyone else here feeling me on this one? God, come, I, if I could find a way out of this crypt, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be really great. Uh, God bless. <laughs> God bless. I'm going to cut now to David Duchovny, who's also in a crypt. <laughs> uh, Scully! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so there you go. What's your, oh. le- what's your least favorite thing about this game? Alright, least favorite thing is definitely all of the sidebars where they try to reconcile the fact that their game wants you to be an asshole. Yeah, there's a lot. Because if you're going to have a game that's Tales from the Crypt and you're setting it up as, no, the Crypt Keeper wants to see people die in interesting ways and the whole point of this, as a player, going in, you know you might die at any time, then that's the game you're playing. And then they try to go, oh, but players hate it when you kill someone that they made a character, so try to be nice and do this and that. But also be a dick, but don't be too much of a dick. I'm like, no, just pick one. Yeah, it's a metronome. It just keeps, it, every every parent, one time they have a sidebar, it's arguing with the previous sidebar. Yeah, it's, oh, you should try and have someone fall down the stairs and break their neck, but maybe bring them back later and they're okay because it would be sad if they were dead. I'm like, fucking, no, pick a side. Right. Uh, so that's that's mine. What about yours? My least favorite thing in this book is the Tales from the Crypt book specifically, not the Master Book system. Is that every rule that they add to Master Book from Tales from the Crypt is shit? Yes, every single one. Having the Crypt Keeper as an enemy doesn't do anything. The Crypt Keeper points don't do anything. I mean, they're there, and you can use them to roll and, and I guess salve your conscience about killing off your own players. But realistically, it's still just decide whether or not you want to give them these Crypt Keeper points. So you're still just killing them. They don't do anything. Yeah. The new skills are unbelievably dumb, because most of them are just shit you could do with the existing skills in the in the master book, and then they break them down further. So it's like, oh, in the first book, you have compu- in master book, you have computer use. You can use this to use a computer, or at increased difficulty, to hack a computer. Not in this game, because this game adds hacking. Yep. But computer what is it? hacking is all, its own skill. All, it starts with the sentence, you can't hack with computer operations. Okay, how did people hack in the, in the core book then? They did it with computer operations, you fucking liar book. Oh, yeah. And also, what are you doing in a Tales from the Crypt source book? How many computer hacker stories were there? Like, I don't know, probably one. <laughs> God damn it. And you know it's going to be all Lawnmower Manny and, like, 80s and bullshit. Oh, well, it's going to be someone who's like, Oh, I've been chatting it up with this lady, and then I hacked, and I got all of her information, and then it turned out she's a murderer Then she ghost. hacked me oh! with an axe. <laughs> It seems he was the one who got hacked. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that you get. Instead, it, what, it, what it does in this game is it says, how to computer hack. Use your mental skills as physical skills and get in a fight with another computer. Oh, yeah, that was the best, where it's like, oh, your mind is your strength, and then you punch a computer with your brain meats. And I'm like, oh, great, wonderful. Great. That's why I was thinking Lawnmower Man. Yeah. It's like the last scene in Johnny Mnemonic is supposed to happen. <laughs> a dolphin sent me into this computer, and I have to fight it. 
to get all these memories out of my brain. Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> so there you go. Least favorite thing in this book is the new rules, which are all useless additions. It would have been better if the book was just suggestions and adventures. Okay. Okay, would you play this game? Uh, I'd give it a shot. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand. Master Book system seems kind of... It's terrible. It's clunky. It looks like an old workhorse of a system. Like you Yeah, tell well, it's, like, anytime you have those generic systems, yeah. it just seems a little kludgy. Yeah. Because you're trying to get it to do everything. Right. So, it's so a, I feel it would be weird and I'd have to have a lot of charts, but I'd, I'd give it a chance just because I like stupid horror stuff. Sure. And I feel like Tales from... Oh, sorry. Yeah, but you. Would yeah. you? Hey. Would you play it? Uh, huh? I, I don't would, know. Would you? Would you? Huh? I can't answer you? unless you ask. That's the rules. I mean... Otherwise, I won't. I'm not an improvised question answerer. I'm not trained in that, so I can't see an answer unless a question's been asked. It's pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. I, I feel like I'd rather play another game where we did a Tales from the Crypt adventure for one night for fun. You know, like like you're playing like D and D, and everyone was like, "All right, this adventure is Tales from the Crypt." So there's a there's a a hard luck woman who's been done wrong, and all this other. Okay, that's a little more noir. Sure. Yeah. I can see the eye roll happening. <laughs> Look upon me, <laughs> know that I roll my eyes at thee. Whatever, there's some Crypt Keeper shit happening. There's, you, you come into a creepy small town and everyone in town is a weird murderer. Great. Great. So there, I awesome. can see that as a one-off adventure in another game. I don't feel like Tales from the Crypt by itself needs to be a setting that exists. Not really. So, that I'd say I probably wouldn't play this. And again, I agree that the Master Book system, based on a cursory reading, is pretty clunky. It, it seems like it takes forever to do anything in it. Yeah. No, you need you, you, I mean, to roll. a real good roll to get anything accomplished. And then even when you roll, it's like, all right, roll this, add all these numbers, compare it against a chart, that'll give you a number, add some numbers to that number, compare that against a chart. Yeah, it's a lot of rolls and comparing charts. Yeah, I mean, even in, like, Marvel Heroes role-playing game, it was like, you, you still had to compare, every time you did anything, you compared on a giant periodic table of chart results, but at least you only did it once. You know, you rolled and you were like, do I hit? Roll. Check. Check the chart. In this, it's like, do I hit this guy? Roll. Check a chart. Get a number off that chart. Add some numbers to the number you get off that chart. Compare that to a different chart. Yeah. It's like, why am I doing two charts? I want one chart. One chart game, or no charts. <laughs> okay, so no, probably not. Okay. There you go. So, did you want to fit in any more Crypt Keeper jokes? No, I'm good. Okay, great. Well, there you go. This has been the System Mastery Podcast. As always, you can find us at systemmasterypodcast.com. Or your choice of social media outlet. It's always System Mastery, and there we are, and you can find us and talk to us. We usually try to talk back, unless you said something stupid. And then we'll definitely we'll talk definitely, back. Usually on the show. Yeah. So, by all means, approach us, ask us your questions. We need, we always need more questions for our Afterthought podcast, which you'll be finding next week, when we just talk about whatever we want. Uh, as always, you can find our other show, Movie Mastery, every other Thursday, except during the month of October, when Horrortoberfest is happening. Which is when John here reviews a horror movie in text every day, all October long. You can find that on our website. And on Thursdays, instead of it being in text, it's a podcast. Yay! So tune in on Thursday when we're going to watch the last big horror movie of October. Who knows what it will be? Something. We don't know, because we roll them. We roll yep. them randomly. So if you have an idea for a horror movie, send it in. It's not too late, because it's a random roll. Yeah, you got a couple more days left to get them in there. There you go. Uh, as always, you can support our Patreon. You can find that at System Mastery slash Patreon or something, or just look at Pat look us up on Patreon. It's easy, and uh, support us there. Give us a dollar; it helps us keep the show afloat. That would be awesome. Of course, we also have bonus content that we put out when these episodes come out. So, if you want to uh, hear us making characters, which is what we normally do for our bonus content episodes, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon. It's the only way you get to hear those. And I think that's all the plugs we got to do. Yep, that's everything. Great. Well, uh, I think we're all set. Thank you very much for listening, and have a wonderful week. Do 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 do. Hey. No. <laughs> and then a dog bit someone's dick. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. And then a dog came out and bit his dick off. <laughs> there were boobs in the background. <laughs> I was jerking off in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>